Sing for Science is made possible in part by support from Science Sandbox, an initiative of the Simons Foundation. Today's episode was co-produced with Noise for Now, a national initiative that enables artists and entertainers to connect with and financially support grassroots organizations that work in the field of reproductive justice, including abortion access. Learn more at noisefornow.org. Don't forget to check out our other episodes and please enjoy the show. I want us to really start to think about how to be more nuanced and complicated in this discussion because that's what abortion and reproductive health rights and justice are. They are complicated things in our lives. We need to stop pandering to anti-abortion people who are filled with stigma that allows us to get into our feelings about these things without actually really talking about the science and actually talking about the experiences of these things. Yeah, you've got to fight to make it. You've got to fight to make it. Welcome to Sing for Science, the show where musicians and scientists talk about music and science. I'm your host, Matt White. Each week, we'll talk about a song by our guest artist and how it connects with our guest scientist's area of expertise. Today, we'll be speaking with beloved country singer-songwriter Margot Price. Margot recently teamed up with Mavis Staples on her song Fight to Make It, which she wrote as an affirmation of solidarity with those Americans whose human rights continue to be stripped away by U.S. policymakers. Also joining us is renowned nurse scientist and family health expert, Dr. Monica McElmore. Dr. McElmore's research draws on reproductive justice theory, which is defined as the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, have children, not have children, and parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities. Monica is regarded as a leading voice following the Supreme Court's Dobbs decision and is often called on to appear in related cases as an expert witness given that she is able to speak from her experience as clinician, researcher, and healthcare advocate. The title of this week's episode on the podcast is Fight to Make It, Defending Reproductive Health Care with Evidence-Based Policy Research. Hello, Margot and Monica. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having us. Yes, hello. So, Margo, I, I'm so curious about how Nashville operates, so forgive me if I come off as voyeur, but um, you were born quite literally a Midwestern farmer's daughter in Illinois. Yes, I am. And if you find out how Nashville operates, let me know also. <laughs> I'm trying to figure that out myself. <laughs> well, I guess my first question is, was it hard to gain acceptance as a country singer in Nashville coming from a northern state? Um, well, 100%. And, you know, I've explored all different genres. And to tell you the truth, when I moved here 18 years ago, I didn't really know that I wanted anything to do with the country genre as I saw it. Um, playing out in those days. Mm. But um, yes, I floundered in this town for, I think it was about 12 years before anything actually kind of took off for me. And, um, Mm. you know, I had been in various bands and played all these uh, different shows around town. But I think that uh, sometimes my my songs and my subject matter um, maybe were a little bit too bitter for uh, people who like to sugarcoat things uh, sometimes. Well, so forgive my ignorance, but it, the kind of country m- music that you play now is it has a little bit more crossover with folk and Americana than more mainstream. Yeah, I, I've always kind of gravitated towards more uh, roots music and uh, just songs that have uh stories or you know paint a picture in a in some kind of way maybe maybe just less uh pop Mm. influence maybe there was this great quote from you i guess it was when your first record came out in 2016 that you were like you were bracing for backlash and and being pilloried for having been a northerner in a nudie suit writing songs about drinking Oh, I don't even remember saying that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was pretty good. Yeah, it's you know, it's it's funny how 
people can really just like judge you on anything or uh, try to put you into a box or say that like a, a certain demographic or yeah. a certain uh, group of people like own a genre of music when mm. quite literally music and art is for everyone. And um, yeah, I have been trying to, to break down some doors since I got here and it's uh, it maybe has not worked always in my favor, but it's been an interesting experiment. I think it's going pretty well. <laughs> I guess what I, the, the one other thing that I want to know about Nashville, and I understand that perhaps you're in the dark as well somewhat, or at least you feel as though you are. Do you have much interaction with the Nashville apparatus that's behind like a Kenny Chesney or a Carrie Underwood? No, I try to kind of steer clear of that crowd, <laughs> but um, yeah. I mean, I definitely have taken meetings with people like that and I've had mm. um, like a publishing deal and whatever, mm. but I don't like kind of, I don't go do the like rubbing elbows of just a lot of the people who run these award shows and like run these, these labels, yeah. but I do try to stay on the outskirts of that. I feel like the whole thing is cloaked in so much secrecy uh, that it, it remains such an enigma to me. So yeah, it's it's a lot of like uh, feels like private clubs or um, yeah, I don't know, just a lot of people kind of doing the same thing and just like writing songs about like mm -hmm. objectifying women or like I don't know how big your truck is, and um, so the second that they have, anybody is like tries to disrupt the ecosystem and talk about like how you know uh, how either a the music sucks or b it's just like this exclusive mm. whitewashed like uh, boys club or yeah talk about politics or anytime especially a woman tries to do any of that it's going to make some people angry and um, it's going to ruffle some tail feathers but. It needs to be done. Things are slowly changing. There's so many great organizations that are coming out of this. Like um, Black Opry is a really exciting um, kind of movement that's going on right now. There's mm. there's definitely space. I think the Americana Music Association has really done a good job of trying to be more inclusive. I mean, it's it's been a long time coming, mm. and it, you know they still have their. Uh, their quirks to be worked out as well. But I think that people are aware that, um, that it needs to change in a lot of ways and yeah, trying yeah. to, to eradicate some of the sexism and racism and, uh, just small mindedness that has kind of historically been a part of many of these organizations. Sure. Well, let's talk about the song that's brought us here, Fight to Make It. Could you give us some background on it and why you wrote it? Well, I do have to give credit to my husband, who is a great um, ally, and he brought this song to me. He had the start of it, and he brought it, and then we kind of decided this was about maybe four years ago. It was a song that you know was kind of written in the style of like the Ronettes, Ronnie Spector, like girl groups, like doo-wop and stuff from back mm -hmm. in the... 60s and and the subject matter is you know there's a there's a verse about Rosa Parks there's a verse about Amelia Earhart and it was really just kind of like a song about um you know what it is like to to struggle in this country and um seen through the lens of many different people and uh, after it was finished I started realizing that uh Ronnie Spector was still out there and like still, you know, I've been, I'd read her memoir was greatly influenced by her story. She's just like such an important figure in American music and somebody who really lived through years of terrible abuse and, um, being taken advantage of. And so anyway, long story short, Ronnie Spector and I started writing each other through the internet and I sent her the song and she loved it. And she was like kind of planning this comeback and um, because her memoir had been, was going to be re-released with this forward from Keith Richards and all this stuff. And um, so Ronnie was going to sing on the song and, um, you know, unfortunately nobody knew that she was struggling um, with cancer. And so she just kept trying to, to get it done and get in there and she did not get to make it to the studio in time and um 
she wrote me a really lovely handwritten letter with some with the lipstick on it. Mm. And um, I sent her some notes back and forth. And so we got to have this great um, kind of communication. But anyway, so Ronnie could not make it. I reached out to Mavis, who is obviously just um, such a force of nature and has been a hero of mine uh, for a long time. And Adia Victoria, who, if you have not checked out her music as well, she put out one of the greatest albums last year. Dear friend of mine, someone who I look up to very much as a poet and a blues artist. And she sang on there as well. Mm -hmm. She takes a verse. And um, okay. so we got to, you know, still do the song and like dedicate it to Ronnie. And, um, and we gave oh. all the profits to Noise for Now, which is a grassroots organization yeah. for reproductive That's justice. I'm representing right now with this yes, t-shirt. I have that shirt. I like to wear it and get yeah. looks for people in the local grocery store. Good. So there was something in the press release that I got for the song pointed out that Tennessee, where you live and are raising two children of your own, has more restrictive abortion laws than the Taliban. Is it often the case that you engage with other Tennesseans who have a radically different viewpoint about reproductive health care than you do, Margo? Um, you know, I just want to to end all the stigma that has been going around. I don't um well, like I said, you know, I wear my row shirt to the grocery store and I catch the looks. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I say what I can online. And I went I marched. Yeah. I went um, you know, there was a march in Nashville mm -hmm. and I went out and there were counter protesters. It was it was really important that I went and and did that. And and that was probably where I came <laughs> most head to head with people that um, seemed that they were pushing their agenda. They seemed violent. They seemed angry. And it was um, it was pretty eye opening to go like witness some of that. Yeah. This is a good opportunity to ask about your own experience with pregnancy. You are the mother of two and your firstborn's twin tragically died in infancy. Mm -hmm. May I ask how your experience has shaped your views about reproductive health care? Um, I think it has given me a lot of empathy for mothers who go through difficult things like this. Um, my mother also had, you know, she had, I think, about six miscarriages and you know, she had like a kind of a stillbirth that she was, um, had to go through the labor of, and they, you know, they gave her a bunch of really difficult things to try to have her go into labor. And then it didn't work. And she had to, um, have a DNC. And, you know, there's, I think, um, when I have read statistics about, um, mortality rate with black women and just how, how much more common it is and, that is really, really hard for me to hear about. And, you know, I, I just think that more needs to be done. There just needs to be more of a light shed on it. And, you know, even as all of this has been unfolding in the, in the past six months to a year, there's so much that I'm learning. There's so much because I think that women in general are taught to not talk about our pregnancies and not talk about, especially not talk about the ones that don't go right. You know, as we're hearing more and more women coming forward sharing their stories about tubal pregnancy and and how they're saved by abortion. Um, these are things that I did not even know. These are things that we are not taught in our sex ed class when you're in sixth grade. You know, you're just kind of going over the basics. And then after that, it's like, just uh, push it all down. Be quiet about it. Don't talk about these things because it makes mm -hmm. people uncomfortable. And I definitely experienced that even after I lost my son and he was two weeks old and it was just kind of like, you know, just don't talk about it because it's making people feel sad. And, um, mm. and yeah, it's, uh, it's been a, a long road of learning and, um, but I really have connected with so many women, so many parents, so many humans who have also been through something similar. And I think we just need to break down the stigma, um, surrounding it. I completely agree. And this is one of those situations where people who are telling their stories are some of the most courageous people on the planet. And um, what a lot of people don't understand is, and this is widely assumed to be an underestimate, but 25% of pregnancies, a full quarter of pregnancies end in miscarriage. 
And we widely think that that's an underestimate. And we think that that is normal because when there are either genetic malformations or fetal issues, it, it, it is sort of the nature evolutionary way for the body to be able to clear those pregnancies. I will tell you, your story touched me in ways that I can't describe, but I will say this. My mother too, it was interesting. I was an adult and my nieces, both of whom, whose births I was at, we were in a car and I was driving and my sister, their mother, was sitting next to me and my mom was in the back seat with her granddaughters. And one of my nieces, who was seven at the time, said to my mother, Nana, why is there such a, a huge age discrepancy between Aunt Monica and our mom? And she said, well, I had a baby, you know, in between them, but the baby died. It was the first time me and my sister ever heard that story. And I'm a nurse, right? I'm a scientist. You're absolutely spot on in terms of we need to be curating spaces for people to talk about all their pregnancy stories. Yes. And the complexity that goes with that. I've been telling my own story recently, and I've, I've hesitated historically because I've not wanted to stigmatize other people, but I have never been pregnant. And I have no idea what kind of pregnancy decision I would make. And people look at me like I'm strange because I was on abortion related billboards. I, yeah, I wrote an amicus brief in the Dobbs case supporting abortion as a reproductive health rights and justice issue. But I have never personally had to make a pregnancy decision. And I don't know what I would do. And I think we need more space for these complicated conversations because we also know, you know, you alluded to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention statistics that Black women are three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy and childbirth related issues. But we also need to cite the data from Guttmacher, which states that, you know, between the ages of 15 and 44, it's widely estimated that one in four people will have an abortion in their lifetime, right? Prior to COVID-19, pregnancy and childbirth were the number one reasons that people were admitted to hospitals and healthcare institutions. We have an estimated 4 million births a year, about 800,000 abortions per year. That's almost 5 million pregnancies. The number one reason prior to COVID-19 that people had any interaction with the healthcare system was due to pregnancy. And so it's very common mm -hmm. and all pregnancies end. They just don't all end in birth. And I think we need to be better about talking about that because we need to have space and grace for people regardless of what their pregnancy outcome is. And that's the place where I think, you know, people who are very anti-abortion have screwed up. They don't understand that everyone knows and loves somebody who has had an abortion. Everybody knows and loves somebody who's had a miscarriage. Everybody knows and loves somebody who has had a birth or who has been at a birth. These are universal human experiences. 100%. When we spoke last mm -hmm. week, you'd said that reproductive health research can be grouped under three umbrellas. There's the ethics data, clinical data, and policy data. And so... I'm assuming the messaging surrounding that, and you alluded to this in what you just said, in as much as we're all connected to someone who's had a birth experience or an experience with abortion or miscarriage. So that falls under ethics. And could you tell me what they discovered about the messaging in, in New Mexico? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, let's, let's talk about New Mexico real quick before I talk about this. So in the United States, most of the abortion care that's provided is provided by what we call independent clinics, right? Full disclosure, I'm on the Abortion Care Network Board, and that is the membership organization. That is the umbrella for the independent abortion providers. New Mexico has really great abortion laws, which is why all of the clinics that were formerly located in Texas, like Whole Women's Health, are they're moving their operations to New Mexico. The Pink House, the defender of Jackson Women's Health in Mississippi, they're moving their services to New Mexico, right? So there's a reason for that, not just because of New Mexico's geographic proximity to most of the Midwest, but it's also because they have really, really great abortion-related laws. And that's because a lot of the on-the-ground indigenous and reproductive justice organizations have codified abortion into their state constitution. That said, one of the messaging that's very important that came out of the New Mexico comms study around abortion is that we have to be very clear with the public what we're talking about. And we have to make distinctions around who gets to make pregnancy decisions. 
What they found was that when they asked, do you want individuals and communities making pregnancy decisions or did you want the government to be able to, overwhelmingly they found that, that those decisions rest with pregnant capable people and the constellation of individuals around them, their, their church, their community, their family members, the people involved in the pregnancy, but it was never the government. The other thing they found in that study was that it was very, very important that there would be local messengers, right? That this not come from on high from any place, but that people needed to have opportunity to talk to trusted people in their lives. And depending on age, if they were young people, they needed to be able to talk to trusted adults or other young people. If they were people who had had miscarriages and other kinds of fetal issues, they needed to know that they could trust their clinician to be able to give them evidence-based, non-biased information for them to be able to make a decision. But it was never this idea of you have to decide if you are pro-life and pro-choice and be able to seek information at those two venues. That was never the way that we would get effective communication about the science of how people should make decisions specific to pregnancy and abortion more broadly. And wasn't there also one more piece to it conveying like, even though you may not want to make this decision for yourself, you have a daughter, a sister, a mother, an aunt. Right. And that even people who were against abortion, they were very clear because this was one of the best surveys that has ever teased these two things apart. Even if you're personally against abortion, when they ask the question, do you believe that you should have the right to make the decision for another person? People overwhelmingly said no. So mm -hmm. it was this idea of, I want to impose this in my personal life. But I don't believe it's right for my personal beliefs to dictate the decisions of other people. That was the first time we actually had really good data to show that people can discern between personal decisions they would make for themselves and whether or not they should be in a position to legislate the decisions of other people or to have any say in the decisions of other people. Um, there's another study that really grabbed me, and I kind of want to give a shout out to Sean Otto's book, The War on Science, mm -hmm. where he mentions a study in Texas where they studied the effects of an abstinence-only sex ed program. Yeah. <laughs> Margo got to this in her comments about sex ed class, right? right? <laughs> so here's the thing about abortion, birth in this country. It's really about the sex. Right. I mean, it's really this idea of what information should people have access to and what they should. I love Sean Otto's book, by the way. When we study people who had educational exposure to abstinence only education, what they found was that those individuals felt ill prepared not only to engage in their own personal sex life, but they also were subject to misinformation and disinformation. Let's be clear, reproductive justice does not posit, it's not just the, the, the human right to be able to birth, to not birth and to parent children in safe and healthy communities. There's a fourth tenet to reproductive justice, which is to be able to disassociate sex from reproduction. Right, Marga? I mean, you probably have had, I'm old, right? So you probably have had access to sex education more recently than I have. Now as a person who teaches it, to college students. I know having a full range of information, science-based information about healthy sexuality, about even naming your sexual organs. People in abstinence-only education don't even get the correct anatomical and physiological names for vagina, for uterus, <laughs> for ovaries. What do they call them? Private parts. Uh, no. Again, way. back to the shame, the, down the fear, there. and everything. And right. my, you know, my husband was um, raised in homeschool, and then he went to a Christian high school, and never had sex ed, never had these conversations, and it was very much fear, shame. I was lucky enough that I did get to go through sexual education, but I think it was a very narrow-minded approach, as you know, as you said. And a defensive one, yes. avoid this, don't do that, right. avoid this, don't do that, yeah, right? It's really better if you just mm. don't do it at all, but if you're going to do it, here's how you have to do it. And it, it's just, it becomes this whole kind of shameful conversation. I think, you know, even in music, you know, men have been able to talk about their orgasms and, you know, have incredible conversations about their sexual pleasures. But when women try to do that, it's like, shut this down. This is, we cannot talk about a woman's orgasm. It's too mysterious, the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. So I think, yeah, just yeah. getting back to not, 
making people do things out of fear. It doesn't work. And that is where the church has gone wrong in a lot of ways. Yeah. And it keeps people in a defensive stance. It doesn't teach people how or even if they want to be able to do these things. Right. But we can't end that way. Right. Yeah. I mean, because <laughs> reproductive justice shows us a path forward. This row thing is temporary. This is why a whole lot of reproductive justice advocates went to the United Nations last week and actually asked that human rights violations and criminal proceedings be brought against the United States for this overturning of Roe, for this reproductive mm -hmm. oppression for individuals. We will continue to utilize every leverage point that we can in the world to draw attention to these issues. Our maternal morbidity and mortality rates are shameful. Mm -hmm especially when we know that 60% of those are preventable. I wrote about this in my Scientific American piece. But we are lacking a representative populace that will allow us to operationalize health equity, and we have to make it stop. And as citizens, we actually have the power to do that. What did they discover from that Texas study? Because I'm assuming it was implemented to try and keep down pregnancies and abortions, but it had the reverse effect. Well, so we know that abstinence-only education results in increases in not only sexually transmitted infections, but in that study, they also found that there was increases in unintended or unwanted or mistimed pregnancies. And so it did the exact opposite of what they were trying to accomplish mm -hmm. and or achieve. They wanted to use abstinence-only education okay. to keep people from becoming pregnant, to keep people from becoming exposed to sexually transmitted infections, including ones that cause cancer, like human papillomavirus. But what they ended up seeing in the cohort of individuals when they went back and surveyed those young people is that they saw increases in all three. It did the exact okay. opposite of what it was supposed to. They were trying to scare people out of engaging in sexual activity. They were trying to scare people out of potentially being exposed to unintended pregnancy, and it did the exact opposite. Could you also talk about who is getting abortions? Yeah, yeah. This is really important. I already said, according to Guttmacher data, that at some point across their reproductive lifetime, people between the ages of 15 and 44, one in four will have an abortion. It's very important that people understand that abortion is common, it is not rare, and that is an experience that is part of a reproductive trajectory of a lot of people. That said, there is no majority of abortion patients if you don't collapse race and ethnicity. So we widely believe in surveys that we've done, both with Guttmacher and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, that about 25% of people who have abortions are white, 25% of people who have abortions are black, 25% of people who have abortions are Latinx, 25% of people who have abortions are Asian. But what happens is because our proportions in the population are not that high, like black people are only 13% of the U.S. population, but if we're having abortions at estimated between 25 and 28% of abortion patients, that's overrepresented as abortion populations, right? If you collapse all people of color versus white people, it, it makes it look as though people of color have abortions at higher rates than white people do. Mm. But that's because the largest proportion of people who have abortions in the United States are number one, already parents, because the Turner Way study told us that, that 88% of people who have abortions are already parents. 88%. Yes, which tells us that the people who have abortions and people who have babies are not different people. They're the same people at different time points in their lives. The other thing I'll say about the disproportionate rate of abortion amongst black people and people of color more broadly is because the greatest proportion of people who have abortions are poor people are people who are low income and are people who are of reproductive age. That makes sense. So when we think about this, this is why the Helms Amendment and the Hyde Amendment that you can't use federal funds for abortion are so cruel because those are exactly the people who need them. And they can't use public insurance. Mm -hmm. And a lot of listeners probably think poor people aren't taxpayers, but they are. They're their dollars too. Yep. When we think about this abortion discussion, again, it is always more complicated than how it's been represented. Okay. There is no majority of abortion patients unless you collapse people based on race and ethnicity. But the largest group of people who mm. have abortions in the United States are low income and or poor. Okay. And I know that it's maybe premature to do this, but can you speak to what what impact will the Dobbs decision have? Yeah, that's real simple. The Dobbs decision is going to result in what's been going on 
I would argue, for the last 30 years. We are going to see the continued criminalization of pregnant people, and that will be most strictly born on black and brown communities. We will continue to see other health care services impacted by this decision that people didn't really realize or recognize were going to be problematic, whether it's the inability to access methotrexate and other anti-inflammatory and anti-autoimmune medications for individuals who have those conditions. Because if you are in the range of pregnancy age, 15 to 44, you have pharmacists refusing to fill your prescription, right? I mean, so we have, there are downstream impacts that people didn't think about because they were lazy enough to keep people in their emotional feelings about abortion and not the actual science. This is a necessary, important service when you think about tubal pregnancies. You can resolve those early if you give people mifepristone and misoprostol, the same medications we use for medication abortion. And somebody doesn't have to have surgery and lose their tube. Mm. Their future fertility is not impacted. But see, we don't talk about this like that. So there will be further criminalization of pregnant people. We will see continued strictures of other reproductive health services in the United States because people don't understand, like DNC, we use that for endometrial biopsy for people who are having abnormal bleeding after they've completed menopause. They're not even in the pregnancy window. But if you don't get training... And that's now illegal. No, it's not. But the people who best know how to do that are people who do abortions. Right. So if we're not training other people how to do that, then who's going to do your endometrial? Like it has downstream impacts. If we only have a limited workforce that has a specific skill, then how are we going to train other workforces Mm -hmm. to be able to do that skill when we already have an over impacted Mm -hmm. healthcare system, not just because of Dobbs, but because of COVID Mm -hmm. and because of like the aging of the healthcare workforce. Right. So it gets very complicated criminalization of pregnant people, and we will continue to see unintended consequences of the Dobbs decision in in mm-hmm. other aspects and areas of health care. Let me just shout out something that Margot said, though, that's really real, and I hope the listeners really understand this. We have been very lazy in our ability to understand the experiences of women and pregnant capable people in science. We're talking about half the population. And yet our scientific enterprise didn't even include women in clinical trials until 1976. They didn't even include female rats in studies, right? I mean, so like, let's just start the largest funder worldwide of biomedical research has not included us in data. So the data that we do have are incomplete. And I say this as a scientist who actually conducts research in reproductive health rights and justice, they're incomplete. However, From an ethics perspective, this idea of what's your professional responsibility to be with the people that we serve, the people who seek and need abortions. Our professional organizations are very clear about this. The American Nurses Association, American Medical Association, American Public Health Association, they're very clear that abortion is health care. And as long as it's true, then that means that you have an ethical obligation to provide care to the public. When we see mass shootings or when we see other kinds of healthcare situations, we don't decide in real time if we are or are not going to take care of those people when they show up at the hospital, even though they they haven't been adjudicated through some legal process. We don't think, oh, that person was the shooter, so therefore we're not going to take their bullet out and we're not going to take them to surgery. We don't make those kinds of ethical judgments or decisions about people, but we want to ethically judge and deny care to 10 year old pregnant people who have been <laughs> assaulted by family members? Like seriously, that that's where we're at, mm-hmm. right? Have you ever said someone, I remember nurses got fired in Boston when the, the uh, Boston Marathon shooter, uh, they went on Good Morning America and was talking about how, well, if they had come to my ER, I wouldn't have taken care of him, not realizing that was a violation of the American Nurses Association Code of Ethics. We mm-hmm. don't do that anywhere else in healthcare. All of this was purposive to get people to think that abortion is some other kind of thing, reproductive health care is some other kind of thing, and it doesn't fall under the clinical umbrella. When you think about the clinical work and, and some of the studies that you mentioned, whether it's the one in New Mexico, all the way to the study that we know that pregnancy is far more dangerous than abortion is. There was a landmark study that came from CDC Data Center for Disease Control and Prevention that showed Dr. Grimes and uh, Dr. Beth Raymond that pregnancy is 14 times more dangerous than abortion. And that is because 
by definition, as a pregnant person, you're immunocompromised because you are housing foreign DNA from another human being. And under normal circumstances, your immune system would try to kill that. So when we think about this notion that pregnancy and abortion, pregnancy and birth, pregnancy and surrogacy, these are all complicated things. And so when we message things to individuals, it's very important that we be precise in our language. When we think about the Pew and the Gallup polls around when you poll people about their thoughts about abortion, let's say on abortion to make this simple, the public is with people. Seven out of 10 Americans say that they don't believe that abortion should be illegal. And yet somehow it is now in 11 states. And so when you think about that messaging and you ask people, should government provide abortions for individuals? Should we repeal Hyde and Helms that don't allow for low income individuals who use public insurance, we call that Medicaid, to be able to access abortion services? Most people are like, that's unfair. You shouldn't have differences in healthcare based on what, who's paying for your care. So when we think about this messaging thing, we have to do a much better job at getting people, and this is where Marco's point is really important. Storytelling is a good antidote to disinformation and misinformation. When people can connect their own lived experience and their community's lived experience to understanding these issues, and this is why it's necessary for us to trouble this discussion or to make sure there's nuance to it, that we just don't go to our pro-life and our pro-choice camps, because it's way more messy than that, that we have to help the public to understand that there are rights that only pregnant capable people can make decisions about. We saw that in, in Kansas, people were surprised that they fought a ballot initiative in Kansas mm -hmm. to change their constitution. And the grassroots organizers on the ground, they made sure that the public understood what that meant. That's why it wasn't surprising to me that Kansas said, you are not going to change our constitution to say we're taking rights away from half the population. So we as scientific community, we as a science communication community, that's why this podcast like this is so important. We need to help the public to understand these issues and connect it to their own citizenship, to connect it to their own experiences, such that the science is translated for them in ways that they can understand. I love that. I feel like there is so much like shame and fear and all these things that come along with infertility, with miscarriage, with losing a baby. There's all these things that are emotional to a woman. And then to have the government coming in and interfering with that is just, it's a, it's a whole other level. And I think that just oh, the yeah. whole, whole entire way that the United States does birth, that we make it feel like some kind of illness or sickness. When I was having my second pregnancy with my daughter, you know, I thought, I really would love to have a midwife. I've, you know, I tried, I watched all these documentaries and I was very clear on what I wanted to do and how I thought that it should go down. But because I had had a C-section prior, you know, it was like all of the things that I feared were going to happen ended up happening, inducing me. Mm -hmm. And then the Pitocin, and then I ended up with the epidural yep. and then I ended up with a C-section after like being in labor for basically two days. Yeah. And it was a very, it was, it did not go the way that I wanted. Of course, I was just glad that my baby was safe, but it's like, I feel like the doctors, they have demonized the midwives and make it look like witchcraft. And then it's like, okay, we're just giving everyone a C-section and that's how it's going to be because we don't want to wait around for the miracle that is birth and trusting mm -hmm. women and trusting women's bodies. So can you riff on that for a second? Ooh, I sure will. I mean, I could talk to you all yeah, day. Same. The grand black midwives were discredited by male white physicians and white nurses. And quite frankly, let me say one thing, because I would be remiss not to say this. This Roe loss is temporary, because in the country, we had a whole time where Roe wasn't in existence. And prior to that, we had a diverse workforce of people who had relatively good outcomes across the whole reproductive trajectory, whether it was birth or abortion or stillbirth or miscarriage. Those were the black grand midwives who worked on the plantations and took care of enslaved persons and everybody else. Mm -hmm. Right. So when you think about their contribution to the health of people at that time, 
they had relatively good outcomes. Yes. So when we think about the medicalization of pregnancy and the medicalization of birth, I sit with midwives, right? I'm a nurse by training. So for me, like pregnancy and birth, as you very poignantly pointed out, it's not a disease state to be managed. It is a sacred, physiological, normal condition that needs to be witnessed. That is a very different mindset than thinking about it as a surgical procedure to be completed. And I have done research looking at mistreatment and patients' expectations going into birth and abortion, where patients didn't get what they wanted. And that's because we don't listen to Mm -hmm. them. And I I think this is another place where uh, clinicians in the United States have been perversely incentivized to think that interventions, more is always better. That's not true. And we know this. We know that trial of labor after C-section is a thing. It can be a thing and people can be successful, but you have to have the right team and the right skills to be able to do that. And I unapologetically, after 30 years of being a nurse, I know that includes having a midwife and a doula. I got to say both together. Yes because yeah i just got a doula and she did her best to advocate for me and exactly. you know exactly just gotta shout out yeah, the doulas because her. they do incredible work yeah and i have to say as a nurse the reason doulas are so important is i know in nursing nurses who can read fetal heart monitoring strips but they can't sit by the side of a bit of patient and be able to help alleviate their anxiety, to know the confidence and or fear in their eyes. We've lost some of our skills. And that's also true of our physician colleagues. And this gets into workforce as well, that I further think abortion access is going to be restricted. This is one of the reasons why I'm a plaintiff in many other cases around the country, to be able to remove that physician-only provider of all the reproductive health care, whether it's home birth or hospital-based birth or abortion, or we haven't even talked about contraception yet, yeah. right? <laughs> this notion that we need a workforce initiative, and this is where the policy piece comes in, Matt. You know, we need to rethink what does the sexual and reproductive health workforce look like in the United States that's not dominated by any one discipline? How do we get people to listen to them? How do we rethink 15 minute appointments? How do we rethink clinic versus hospital? How would we get patients to the right care that they need? I would be remiss if I also didn't say this. When we talk about abortion or when we talk about birth, let's stop talking about like it's one thing. We have home birth, we have birth center birth, we have cesarean birth, we have vaginal birth. Same thing in abortion. We have pill abortion, we have self-managed that you can do at home. We have aspiration or DNC where you can come into a clinic. We have DNE or DNX, depending on if you're later in gestation. We have inductions. Going back to your mother's story about having to labor knowing that you know she had a compromised or dead fetus right we abortion is multiple things mm. birth is multiple things can i ask you to define some of those acronyms i think dnc is one of the common ones that people should should know more about yeah yeah, yeah. dilation and curatage dilation and evacuation dilation and extraction and what that means is Think about the uterus as your face and think about your cervix as your lips, right? And if your lips are closed, it has to be opened in order to be able to remove the contents of the uterus. So that's what dilation is. It means to slowly, carefully open the cervix, either with medications or with things we call dilators that look like straws or both, right? So that's dilation. Depending on where you are in the level of gestation, and you mentioned something really important earlier too, Margo, whether it's tubal pregnancy, if the pregnancy is not in the uterus, that is an emergent condition that needs to be managed very rapidly. And we can do it with pills. We can do it with injections. I've given a ton of methotrexate injections for people to resolve a tubal pregnancy, which actually is a chemotherapeutic agent. But again, all these things are connected. Right. When we think about how do we treat different conditions? Well, pregnancy always, regardless of if it's beginning or ending, is a time sensitive condition. Let me say that again. Pregnancy is a time sensitive condition, because if you're going to start prenatal care, we like for you to do that early so we can start all of your screening behaviors and make sure that you can have a healthy outcome. And if you're going to have an abortion, we want you to be able to have that sooner in pregnancy rather than later, regardless of the outcome of pregnancy. It is a time sensitive 
decision. So we need a healthcare system and a, what I would call a community care system that can be responsive to that time sensitiveness. To Marco's point, mm -hmm. we trust people to diagnose themselves with their own pregnancy, right? You can walk into any pharmacy, you can walk into Target and buy yourself a pregnancy test. We trust people to diagnose themselves with pregnancy. We trust people to diagnose themselves with the wantedness, the intendedness, the timing of the pregnancy. Is it the right person to have a baby? We trust them to diagnose whether or not they're going to continue said pregnancy or not. But then we want to control those decisions. That's why this abortion discussion, that's why this birth discussion in place of birth, maternal morbidity, mortality, that's why the only true arbiters of any pregnancy decision is the pregnant person and their family, their God, the constellation of people they want to involved in the decision and not the government. Um, say you're a pregnant mom and the baby dies, you would need a DNC, right? Yeah. In states where there's restrictions, could you tell us like what that looks like? Who makes that call and like how dangerous that is? It's murky, right? I mean, so again, you know, it it is not clear what the legal landscape is in terms of can clinicians be criminalized if they want to be able to, let's say, take a patient to an OR or do an office-based DNC. Depending on the state, mm -hmm. this is really murky. And so there are a lot of lawyers who are working on this, whether it's the ACLU or the Center for Reproductive Rights or If, When, How, Lawyering for Reproductive Justice or the Lawyering Project. There are people, it, it depends on where you live. And this is completely incongruent mm -hmm. with what we already know about social determinants of health. And a lot of, I got to put my editor hat on from Health Equity, but we already know that the care that you receive shouldn't depend on the zip code that you live in. That's been a thing mm -hmm. that we've talked about for the last 20 years, that we've been trying to eradicate these differences in the quality and the caliber of care that people deliver based on their zip code. But that's exactly where we're at in this abortion debate, because mm -hmm. physicians and clinicians have been going to their legal departments at their hospitals and the healthcare organizations to try and figure out what they can and can't do and how they can and can't advise people, mm -hmm. which, again, is disruptive because pregnancy and its outcomes is a time sensitive decision. So it adds time. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to something that that my good colleague, Michelle Goodwin, who's a lawyer, runs the Ms. Magazine podcast. How sick do people have to be in order for, for us to take care of them? If you have a dead baby in your uterus, regardless of what the gestational age is, that needs to be managed in a timely fashion. And so how sick do you have to be in order for us to be able to take care of you, not only to save your future fertility, but as we found out in the Purview Patel case, you could lose your life, right? And for people who don't know her, she was the Hindu woman who died at a religiously affiliated institution because she had an 18 week fetal demise and the hospital spent weeks trying to figure out if they could remove that pregnancy. She died in a Catholic hospital as a Hindu person, did not even believe in this faith that she, and let's remind ourselves that religiously affiliated institutions own one out of six hospital bids in the United States. Hmm. So in that instance, the, the mother superior, or whoever the is the ruling body there decide, the bishops decide, uh, we have to wait till there's no fetal heartbeat till we can remove the dead baby exactly. or if the mom's in sepsis. And at that point, it's usually too late to be able to save someone's life. Because if you have multi-system organ failure because you've been in sepsis for days, if you finally mm -hmm. get the approval, which happened in Patel's case, by the time they were ready to take her to the OR, her organs were not prepared to support her during anesthesia. How sick do you have to be in order for us to be able to provide you good pregnancy-related care? Mm -hmm. that, that decision should be made by your clinician, not your government or your legislature. Yeah. While we're on the topic of the church, I'd like to sneak in one more question about your song, Margo, and it may reflect some narrow-minded assumptions on my part, but... I mean, I know that the the staple singers and pop staples in Mavis, they have a long history fusing activism and ministry. But I guess when I saw that you were doing that song with Mavis and it was in partnership with Noise For Now, one of the questions that popped in my head was, does Mavis's, does her association with the church complicate her support for abortion in any way? I mean, given that the anti-abortion movement is 
powered almost entirely by faith-based groups. So again, maybe a narrow-minded assumption. Monica, please, if, if you want to speak I to I was that. on a panel yesterday with the National Birth Equity Collaborative with Reverend Deneen Robinson, and she made a very important point, which is it's white, Judeo, evangelical Christians. <laughs> and so making these distinctions and being very precise in our language, and I say this as an ex-evangelical, being very, very <laughs> precise mm. in our language is really, really important. And so the fact that, you know, some people want us to live in a theocracy that is only grounded in, in white mm -hmm. supremacy and white Christianity, that needs to be named. Because there's a long history of reproductive health rights and justice with the Black church. I mean, Martin Luther King got the Margaret Sanger Award from Planned Parenthood. And so when you think through this idea mm. of, you know, the church being like this monolithic thing, I think we need to be really, really clear that the Catholic church is responsible for some of the sort of, you know, uh, legislative agenda, evangelical Christian piece. But then there's also you know, straight up white supremacist informed evangelicals who are also trying to assimilate all of us into living in some weird default human narrative that they have around how humans should behave on the planet, which I fully reject. Same. Amen. <laughs> Thank you for answering that question with much more knowledge than I would have. Yeah. But uh Again, it was an assumption on my part, and I'm, I'm glad we're talking about it. But before we wrap up, Monica, I wanted to ask you to speak from your experience as a nurse to something mm -hmm. I heard yeah. I found astonishing. So uh, I have a friend here in upstate New York who was an abortion uh, provider in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And he said a saying that you used to hear among doctors was, bleeding in obstetrics is a bleeding that you can hear. Yep. That's true. Yeah, I was born in 69. So I, I've worked with physicians who and nurses who were around in the pre-row era. And we say that to students all the time, that in opposite tricks, because it's true. Well, even, even if it's normal bleeding post-birth, you can actually hear it. Because so much blood is going to the uterus at term? Well, people forget that you double your blood volume during pregnancy. You actually double your blood yeah. volume. Wow. It's not just in proportion to the, the baby's weight. Exactly. So instead of five liters, you can be walking around with 10 liters of blood as an immunosuppressed person. Wow. And at pregnancy and birth, once the transition of birth occurs, the, one of the, it's hypothesized that one of the signaling mechanisms that we know that the immune system doesn't go into complete shutdown is by evacuating the entire uterus. Mm. And part of that means the associated blood and vasculature that was associated with the pregnancy. So it's, oh, okay. it's a fascinating event but it also can be a very tricky event depending on if you have other comorbidities. Okay. Well, thank you for sticking around. I know I've kept you past your end time. Um, I can't thank you both enough for thank doing you. this. This has been well, such an to, important To episode. me, the connection between music and science is super important. And I am just very grateful, Margo. I, I love your work. I appreciate you speaking out. And thank you for being willing to engage in this conversation. It's meant a huge amount to me. Thank you so much for your advocacy and for your knowledge. And Thank you. I, this was a really, um, really emotional, but a really important conversation to have. Thank you, Matt, for facilitating. And I hope I see you both sometime down the road. Thank you. Me too. Keep up the good fight. Check out Margot's memoir, Maybe We'll Make It, and her forthcoming album, Strays, coming out in January of 2023. Her headline North American tour kicks off in Fayetteville, Arkansas on November 29th and wraps up at Nashville's historic Ryman Auditorium on March 9th. Learn more about Dr. McElmore's work at nursing.uw.edu and you can follow her everywhere on social media at MacklemoreMR. You can learn more about your state's laws on abortion and abortion clinics, funds, and pills at noisefornow.org slash resources. And you can donate to support abortion funds and independent abortion providers at abortionwithinreach.org. Sing for Science is co-produced by TalkHouse and made possible in part by a grant from Science Sandbox, an initiative of the Simons Foundation. Our music is by Panoram, our mix engineer is Lou Carlozo, social media manager is Bailey Constas, and our digital producer is Keenan Cush. 
Special thanks to Jeff Malinowski for additional engineering, Dr. Mark Heller for his counsel, and Amelia Bauer at Noise for Now for her help co-producing today's show. If you liked today's episode, please tell a friend about us and give us a review and some stars. For more information, go to singforscience.org and follow us on social media at Sing for Science. Thanks for listening.